Uh, okay, so uh, a few words about ourselves. Uh, this is Unavout. Uh, I am Gunfail Caldwin. Uh, he is a, a, a Linux programmer, an uh, open source, uh, well, programmer. <laughs> and uh, I am a security researcher at um, a company called Hispastic. Maybe you recall the virus total. Um, and also, uh, we are the main authors. Well, actually, Unavout did the ma most of the project. Uh, but uh, also additional help uh, we got from uh, Euro, uh, that was the same guy that Alex talked about today. Uh, Memek, Oshok, Boblount, and Xas, so thank you for, for, uh, for additional help. Okay, so wh what, act what did we actually do? Well, we ported Syndicate Wars, but uh, what does it mean? Well, uh, we took a DOS game, uh, an old DOS game from like 10 years ago, and we wanted to execute it on uh, modern systems like Lin like GNU Linux, like Windows, like OS X, uh, and we wanted uh, it to be portable also to other systems that are uh, that have ported uh, the libraries like SDL or OpenAL. Uh, but we didn't have access to source code, so it was it became a reverse engineering project. Uh, about the game, well, it's a, a 3D tactical uh, quad action game by Bullfrog. Uh, uh, there was also a prequel, it was called Syndicate, and there was uh, an addition called uh, Syndicate uh, Plus, I, I think. Um, anyway, the, the game used a, a very cool 3D engine and was used later by Magic Carpet, uh, if I remember correctly. And the game looks, well, like this. I will show you a demo of the game. Okay, I will skip the intro. You can download the, the port from our site and, and actually <laughs> see the intro and play the game. It's a little long. Um, well, basically, you have a group of an agents of cyborgs, and you can uh, resist the uh, cyborgs. You can equip them with some weapons of destruction, like uh, standard guns, like UZ, like minigun, and some other. And, uh, Basically, we have some missions that you have to accomplish. Uh, I'll start the mission if it's possible. Okay, so this is how the game actually looks like. It's in 3D. You can even rotate. It uses a software engine, so there is no OpenGL, no acceleration. And uh, basically, what you have to do is you have to, uh, well, you know, fun stuff, go uh, and kill some other agents. Okay, I'll just fun, find someone to kill, and I want to show you another thing. Uh, do you know the, the Ghost in the Shell uh, an animated video? Well, this game has an ad advertisement of Ghost in the Shell, a trailer running in it. It's kind of interesting because it's one of the first times I saw a commercial in a game. And the trailer in those times it was, well, very expensive to have <laughs> wasted uh, space for, for a trailer. Okay, basically some blood, some gunshots, that's what's the game about, and also tactics in the later missions. Let's get back to the subject. Okay, uh, why did we do it? Basically, I have no idea, but here are some excuses. The, the famous security excuse for fun and profit. Um, well, be, because it didn't, when we started, it didn't work on DOSBox. Uh, so we couldn't play on DOSBox, but we actually wanted to play uh, it. And we also were inspired by the, uh, the John Jordan's Frontier First Encounter project. It was uh, another part of uh, another DOS game. He, he basically, did the same as us and ported a, a DOS game to, to modern systems. Okay, how, how did we do it? Well, uh, using recompilation techniques. What does that mean? Uh, it means that we basically took the executable, we disassembled it with, with uh, disassemblers that we created, and Avad will talk about them in a moment. Uh, the disassemble, uh, disassembles uh, gave um, an output that could be compiled, compiled by, by com other compilers, assembler compilers. When we took the listing, the assembler listing, it was about, well, it was very, very long. We tried to find um, functions related to the C library, like printf, like fopen, 
uh, also does specific functions, also video, input, output, sound, etc., etc., and replace it with uh, with some well modern stuff like like SDL or other uh, libraries. Mm. And then we compiled it and got native executables. Sounds easy, right? Okay, this is how we done it, Annabelle. Okay, um, so this is the first stage of, I, of our project. The first thing we needed to do was to disassemble the executable so that we could compile it back again into object form. And um, the executable that the game contains is actually a 32-bit um, DOS executable of the linear executable format. And it works with a DOS extender, which is a layer that allows 32-bit code to work on top of the 16-bit DOS code. And when we examined the executable in a hex editor, we noticed that it was compiled by the Watcom compiler, which helped us a lot later on. And, well, we couldn't find anything that would disassemble it into the form that we wanted to have, so we decided to write our own disassembler and called it SWDISASM. Um, the LE format um, is, in principle, a DOS program in that it contains a 16-bit stub loader um, in its entry point. But that loader, the only thing it does is it calls the DOS 4 GW executable, which is the extender loader, which in turn loads the first executable again, but only loads the 32-bit parts and uh, executes them. And it also sets up the the DPMI layer that the executable will use later. Um, it's not that a simple executable format because it contains sections which are called objects, which are just like the sections in modern um, executable formats. And what was of specific use to us later is that it's re relocatable. So in its headers, it contains tables of relocations that uh, point to interesting addresses. Um, so we wanted the disassembly process to come up with an executable that we could come up with, uh, with assembly source code that we could assemble back again. And that means we couldn't have any fixed addresses expressed as numbers. We needed to have labels that could be used by the assembler to produce code that we could use. And our disassembler needed to, well, when you look at the executable, you get a chunk, well, a series of bytes. And what was important in our case it was that we wanted um, the code and data to be clearly separated because, well, obviously, if there was any error in there, we wouldn't get the right executable. And these were the requirements to get a compilable output. So, We've actually made three attempts at writing such a disassembler. The last one worked pretty well. Um, and I'll move on to them. So the, the first version actually used the decompiler disassembler from the NASM project. And it worked by going through the code in several linear passes. So um, it's possible to deduce in the LE format whether a section is well, in its header says whether it's executable or if it's, if it's data. So it started in the executable sections and went through the code instruction by instruction using the disassembler process and noted all the jumps and calls and the target addresses um, to set them as labels later. It also detected padding between functions and in another pass it would um, try to detect what we called vtables um, which were actually tables of target addresses for either jumps or calls. Um, there wasn't any pattern in there. But, and they, they were located within the code section, and that needed a separate pass. And the output could actually be compiled, again, by NASM into either an ELF binary or a, well, the, the Windows object format. But that had several problems with it. For example, well, we naively tried to um, convert all the references to numbers which look like addresses into labels. So we would end up converting flags like 
um, say, 1000 in hex into a label where, in fact, it was really meant to be used as a flag. And it had other problems like um, putting labels in the middle of instructions, and um, it didn't really detect all the labels properly. So this was all because um, it didn't use the relocations sufficiently, because they were essentially pointing to the right places. And it didn't trace the actual execution, but tried to go byte by byte and determine what the data was. And um, we fixed that in our second attempt, which uh, was tracing this assembler. And well, first we wrote a prototype in Python, but it turned out to be really slow. So then we proceeded to rewrite it in C++. And it actually used uh, bin utils um, from the GCC compiler suite instead of enthusiasm so that we didn't have any more external dependencies. And that also meant that um, all the code in assembler that we have is in AT&T syntax. Um, it worked by storing in its internal state a map of regions that represented the executable. Uh, initially, there was one region for each section, and the types of regions were specified as unknown. And then the tracing later on would determine, subdivide them into smaller regions and determine their type as either data, um, code, or a vtable. It also contained a label list, which was basically a pair of uh, address and name. So I'll give you a short overview of um, what algorithm it used to disassemble the executable. So it worked by maintaining an address queue, which uh, contained all the addresses to go to and trace from them later. Um, initially, the queue started out as empty. And at first, we just added the entry point to it. And um, starting from that address, we traced the code. And as it was doing that, this assembler added all the targets of jumps and calls into the queue to come back to them later. So in a way, this was similar to how IDA does it. Um, and the list of regions was subdivided into smaller ones um, with, a, with a determined type. Um, and basically, what we ended up with was just regions which contained mostly useful information and all the padding between functions and things like that were ignored. Obviously, for the data sections, we didn't trace through code or anything. We just left data sections intact as they were. Um, so the relocation entries in the headers of the LE executable proved to be very useful um, because um, they pointed to all the interesting things like functions and data addresses that were referred to from other places in the code. So that helped us to replace the raw addresses with labels. And in data sections, well, we knew that the, that the relocks pointing to the data sections were going to be interesting data. It still ended up with a few problems. For example, because all the things in between functions were decided to be padding and ignored and omitted in the output, um, some few exceptional cases where there was actually data in the code sections was, I think, treated by, as a V table and the rest of it was ignored and then was missing in the output, which caused us problems later. And there were a few unusual other cases where maybe the code was written manually in assembler instead of in C, and it confused the assembler as well. But it turned out that uh, there were only, well, very few such cases, and once we assigned 14 regions manually in the December source code, it fixed all the problems for us and allowed us to um, produce an object file from the disassembled source code. And um, one thing that we're quite proud of is that it can trace a whole 1.7 megabyte executable in under two seconds. That's assuming that the executable is already in the file system cache. Um, so after we've done that, we had this object file that we could link with other things. So to produce a working executable, well, we knew that we would be combining it with C code later. So we wanted to have a, our own entry point in the form of a normal main function. So um, we needed some way to call the assembler code 
and transfer the, the control from our main function in, into it and link those together. And um, because um, this game was written on DOS, um, the symbols had a prefix of an underscore. But obviously, on other systems such as Linux, they, they don't need them. So we decided to fix that, to use the C preprocessor and actually include the directives in the assembler code so that all the symbols that were referred to from C code that were present in the assembly code would uh, compile on all platforms without a problem. And this snippet, the second snippet below on this slide shows the call to, from this C function, from, from the main function in C code to the main function present in the assembler code. That was the original main function of the game. So once we've done all that, we ended up with a working executable. We could link the C code with the assembler code, and we could run it. That was a major achievement already for us. Um, but unfortunately, the only thing it did was crash very quickly. And I'll let you take over now. OK, so yeah, you, you press Enter, and it crashes. But it really, uh, really fills you with joy when it actually can be executed. Anyway, our next goal was to find all the, uh, the, the um, libraries used in the, uh, in the statically uh, placed in the executable, like, like C library, standard C functions. Uh, also uh, find other, um, well, video input, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, code, and we, we wanted to find it and to replace it with uh, new stuff. So uh, what did we look for? Well, we looked for interrupts, like, uh, well, interrupt in assembler, the interrupt instruction int, the uh, int uh, 386 uh, function from the uh, DOS uh, for uh, Divo, and the set vect uh, function that actually did set up an interrupt handler. Uh, also, port access was very uh, crucial for us. For example, the palette, uh, the palette colors in the, the video uh, are set using port access. And uh, DP, DPMI, DPMI is DOS protected mode interface. Basically, the game is 32 uh, bits, so it's, uh, it runs in protected mode, and, but it uses uh, DOS functions, so there need to be some interface that switch, switches uh, to the real mode and back. Mm. And uh, as I said, the, the CLIP functions. As for the, uh, the C library, uh, well, uh, first, uh, there are, well the, the first, our first attempt was to manually look through, through the listing and try to find the functions. It was like we, we took some, well, let, let's uh, go for an easy pick. We, we took some interrupt 21, and uh, we knew that it was a DOS call. So we, we checked which function, which function was it. It was, for example, two, so it was some reading operations from the disk. And we, we tried to um, translate it a little to, the, uh, to uh, C and to compare it with open Watcom uh, C library um, source. Basically, open Watcom is a, um, sorry about what? It's, uh, it's an open source project where we really used the library from it, the C library, because we could, uh, it, it wasn't exactly the same as the one used in the Syndicate Wars, but it was very similar, so we could compare the code and say, oh, this is this function. It came pretty handy. Mm. And we also looked at nearby code. If we found a function somewhere in the listing, uh, we we checked the uh, function above, the function below. Uh, sometimes they were also from the libc and were uh, easy to, to recognize. Uh, it was time consuming because we had to, well, <laughs> try, try to, to imagine a, a, a disassembler listing that has like uh, 30, 100,000 lines of code and uh, try to find some function there. Well, it wasn't easy, so it was time consuming to find something, to translate it, to compare it with other functions, and to say, oh, this is it. Uh, but uh, we, we did get about 40% of the functions used in uh, Syndicate Wars until um, a friend of ours from the Free, Synd uh, Free Syndicate project, Free Synd project uh, told us that there is a program called IDA. IDA, yeah, you may be familiar with it, and it can actually actually uh, map uh, the, that our file and produce a, a list of, uh, of functions based on signature scanning. And well, he was uh, 
well, he gave us the map of, of the functions and we started to use the map instead. We started this project five years ago and really I didn't use either of them. <laughs> okay, uh, let's continue. Uh, there were problems, of course. We found a function, now we wanted, for example, we didn't want to use the uh, statically, um, statically existing in the code printf, for example. We wanted to use printf from the model on GNU-libc or MS, uh, uh, MS uh, CRT. So, so we needed to, um, well, there were, uh, one of the problems was the, uh, as you can see, the, the incompatible inc com calling convention, mainly, uh, mainly the syndicate words used something called VATCOM fast call or VAT call. It was basically, it was uh, similar to, to the modern fast calls. It placed the arguments in the register, registers. Um, so most of the function, of course, excluding uh, uh, variable argument functions like printf were using VAT, VATCOM fast call conventions. So we needed to, well, to create some, some wrappers that would actually change the convention to uh, something like CD uh, uh, ECL or, well, CD ECL actually. Uh, also, different registers were preserved. For example, uh, today we are not used to preserving the uh, DX register, but uh, in syndicate wars, the, the programmers really relied on preserving that register. So we had a little issue with it uh, uh, too, and we, we really found uh, it out the hard way. Okay, um, anyway, we created something called M, um, make wrappers, MK wrappers. It was a Python script, pretty, uh, well, pretty useful actually. Uh, it took in a, um, well, a, a, a config, uh, config file uh, which had the names of the functions, the type of the function, was it a VATCOM fast call or a, a CDSCL uh, variable argument function. It also took the arguments uh, of the function, like, uh, for example, S stands for uh, char pointer, pointer to char, so a string, basically. And uh, we created um, the config files for each function used by Syndicate Wars, uh, so it would uh, automatically generate us the wrappers we needed. The function, we had like uh, 70 functions, and, um, and also some additional came later. And a wrapper looked like this. It's, well, basically a basic conver a con calling convention converting wrapper. Uh, so, it stores where the registers needed to be preserved. It pushes, pushes the, the, param, the arguments on the stack because this is CDACL. It calls the function from the native C library, and basically it, it uh, well cleans up. Uh, but uh, we wanted also to have some debugging uh, abilities later, so we created a debug version of the wrapper. Uh, it does uh, basically the same thing, uh, except that it also calls uh, printf to print on the uh, standard output. Well, the function and its arguments. Uh, it's pretty similar to what uh, strace creates on, on Linux, for example. Uh, this is what we got after, well, after it be, uh, got working. So basically we can check every uh, C library call and, well, know what happened if the game crashes in another place, and it did crash a lot. Uh, for a variable um, argument function, for example, like printf, we used, uh, well, we didn't actually call printf here, we called uh, uh, vprintf, mm, because it was, it was easier for us to, to do it this way, not to, not to have to uh, set up the stack again, uh, uh, basically because we didn't know even how many arguments there were on the stack, so this was easier. And it also done, uh, this, this wrapper has done some function uh, renames, basically on uh, Linux we have, uh, I, I'm not sure which one we have on which system. I think Esther case compare we have on Linux and Esther ICMP on Windows or well, the other way around. And uh, it needed to be to be uh, also handled if we wanted it to be really portable. And uh, well, as we say, uh, as Anna uh, said uh, a while ago, we have an underscore problem on different o um, operating systems. And also on OS X, there's a stack, uh, call stack alignment problem. It, needed, it needs to be aligned to 16 bits, I think, uh, bytes, 16 bytes. So this also was handled by the wrappers. Uh, Okay, and when we had uh, the, the MK wrapper basically created a, um, an assembler listing with the wrappers and 
uh, when we had that file, we could uh, substitute the, in the original disassembly all the files, uh, all the calls to like printf to call our wrapper like ac printf in this example. Um, this is only an example substitution, so I know there's a bug, just ignore it. Okay, so the game started working, as you can see, and it crashed again after a while, and it's not surprising, but we had we had the wrappers, we had a, a debugging mechanism, so, hmm, so so we could we could continue working. Anyway, this is uh, of course uh, a Windows uh, 98 <laughs> error because where well, when we started the project, I was still using this old Windows, and uh, I would like to well pass the microphone, <laughs> so to say. Um, okay, so <clears throat> we found ways of finding these interesting functions that were DOS specific, as we said earlier, by looking at interrupts and other things. So once we found them, what did we do with them? So, well, we, we had some good reference, and the DPMI spec lists the DPMI interface, and there's an excellent guide to DOS interrupts, which is called Ralph Brown's Interrupt List. It's available on the net on his website. And uh, we use this to identify what this particular interrupt did. So for things such as file manipulation on DOS or um, some hardware operations such as setting the video palette, um, we could sort of guess what this function would be doing just by looking at the interrupt numbers in it. So we identified certain functions like that. In some cases, when we could, we'd just comment the function out, like um, where there was a debug message saying that this is a joystick initialization, we just rip it out and proceed. We didn't need the joystick support. Um, and so once we've made a good guess as to what this particular function did, we'd see at what other functions it called and what um, data variables it touched. Um, so this allowed us to look at these other functions or other functions touching the same variables sort of get an idea of, of how they work together and what modules they formed. Um, so we then would proceed to translate these functions manually into C code. I mean, this is a time-consuming process, but we knew that we'd have to write replacements for them that be portable, and they'd largely have to do the same thing. So by doing this work, we'd already get started on writing the C replacements. Um, and this allowed us to get an understanding of how these particular subsystems work. Um, so in most cases, these replaced functions would um, communicate with the game by uh, changing a set of variables according to some sort of protocol. So for example, um, well, most, many of them were interrupt handlers. So like the keyboard interrupt handler would uh, read the data in um, from the keyboard controller and uh, then set specific variables, which I'll talk about later, um, according to the way that the game would expect it. So, and we did this so that the code would be portable and compile on all possible systems. And in functions that needed it, we just um, use portable free software libraries for functions such as um, video, audio, and input. So the, the particular interesting things that we had to replace to have the game work on modern systems were things such as, well, low-level low DOS functions and hardware functions such as opening files and timers. Um, well, video co code, audio, the input, and um, event loops. So I just gave you a brief overview, and now I'm going to go through all of them in turn. So, um, DOS obviously has a case-insensitive file system, but we want the game to work on systems such as Linux, which are case-sensitive as well. So we ended up having to introduce additional functions that would perform a search of all the files in a path while recursively descending directories and binding them um, just as long as they match the, case, the, the given file name without uh, case sensitivity. And we added things such as support for user profiles. Um, so we'd replace the beginnings of some path with the path to a user-specific directory where the user could store their own save games and stuff. And the game could be installed um, just once 
in the whole system for all the users. Um, there were also just specific functions that were not in the standard C library, such as um, date handling functions and some file handling functions that have been since discontinued. Um, and um, the game also for synchronizing um, frames in playing the intro, it talked directly to the programmable interrupt timer, um, which we could replace by just calling a get milliseconds function in FDL later. Um, for the video part, well, as Ginville said earlier, the game uses a 3D software rendering engine. Um, it actually changed video modes and communicated with the graphics hardware using VESA, which is um, like a standard, standard hardware interface which is still implemented by graphics cards. And um, it used an 8-bit palette, which it would switch dynamically at runtime. Um, so the code that we wrote to provide the replacement needed to basically switch the video mode, provide a pointer to a frame buffer where the game would draw its own frame, and uh, well, handle the palette switches. And we re-implemented all that with SDL, which stands for, I think, Software Development Library or something like that. But it's a game library for developing portable games. So the work that our code needed to was relatively small. We didn't need to touch the renderer at all. We just provided these few replacements, and it worked quite nicely. So, um, so this is the result, as you can see, um, as the next major of the ma next major breakthrough of our um, process of porting the game. Um, I think that that displays the result of the, the bug that we ignored um, one register that needed to be preserved in our wrappers, but quickly we proceeded to correct it, and um, this is the result we got. So this is playing on Linux as you may have noticed. Um, and that was the, the first major important breakthrough that we got was that the intro could play. It would crash before it got to the main menu, and it didn't have any sound. The synchronization was wrong. But once we got this, we were certain that we were getting somewhere. So that's it. And that's also using the earlier version of the disassembler. So part of the code that we had was just plainly wrong. But um, that sort of encouraged us to keep going. Um, so for the input, we need to write replacements for um, keyboard and mouse interrupt handlers. Um, so for example, the, the keyboard handler would um, read off the sort of key press event from, from the hardware, and then it would um, set the correct value. Well, it, the, the code kept a table of all the keys and their state, whether they were pressed or not. And also, there was a ring buffer that uh, had all the events in it of key pressed, keys pressed and released. So um, it was easy enough to um, replace this code with SDL. The hardest part was just translating the hardware key codes. Well, actually, it was the, the event codes taken from SDL into hardware key codes that the game would expect. So instead of, again, rewriting a larger portion of the game, we tried to just keep the, the replaced code to a minimum just so that it would work. And uh, interestingly enough, in the documentation for the mouse um, interrupts well, and the, the, the handlers that it would set up, um, the coordinates the, at the sub-pixel resolution, I think, are referred to as Mickey's, which um, is, well, the, the name is after Mickey Mouse, which we found was um, quite surprising there. We didn't expect it to find it. And um, again, there was a certain set of variables um, that need to be set. Um, once the, the handler would receive a mouse press from the mouse, it would um, sort of set a locking variable that would um, keep the variable there. And then until the game would uh, read off that value and unlock this flag again, um, the handler wouldn't touch it. So there was some sort of synchronization going on that we needed to figure out before we could write a replacement. Um, the, for the audio, the, the game used a library written by another company, which is called Miles Sound System. It was statically linked inside the executable for the most part, except for the particular hardware with different sound cards, which was stored in separate files. Um, in this case, 
our approach was quite different in that we didn't start from the lowest level of looking at interrupt numbers and things like that. Um, we actually managed to well, find several things that helped us analyze from, from the top. So we found a get end of call with um, this variable AIL debug, um, which we found out if this was set to a particular value, the game would output a log of all the calls to uh, the standard output. And if I remember right, um, we ran the game on a real DOS system with this flag set on, and then we'd save the log and then compare it with what we got um, in our case, which of course didn't work. But um, after commenting out some hardware-specific in initialization code, we'd still be able to look at the calls made to the sound driver. So in addition to that, um, we found on the internet um, the headers containing all the function functions and the signatures and the structures used by this library. It was actually a newer version, so it wasn't exactly the same, but it helped us a lot. And it also helped us figure out um, the way how it worked in more detail. So we used these things. We identified the functions and the data structures, which allowed us to re-implement the code portably. Um, so originally, um, the sound card driver would signal an interrupt um, saying that the buffer was free and put some more samples in it to, to play them at the speakers. Um, but we had to get rid of that. We re-implemented re the code using OpenAL, which is a portable audio library, um, which is designed after OpenGL. And uh, the game played music um, directly from the disk, which we didn't want because nobody plays with disks in the, in the drive anymore. So um, we actually ripped the to the Vorbis file format and um, implemented our own code that would play them play the music from the files. Um, another interesting thing that we need to replace was the event loops. Because um, hardware would provide notifications to the game using interrupts when interesting things happened, um, well, we obviously didn't have that option. Um, we only had a single thread. So um, we can use any sort of, any, we can use that sort of thing. So um, we made a basically an update function, which would be called periodically to update all the events, like input events, and um, to flip the frames. Um, but this turned out that it was a problem. So the, the first sort of main loop that we encountered was in playing the intro. That was also done by a separate library. And um, we managed to provide the, the flipping code and audio code and in there, like put an update function call in the middle of that loop playing the video. And then we found out the, the place to put the, um, the correct calls for displaying the main menu. But then we found that when we launched a mission, for example, the game would switch to a different main loop. And essentially, because there was no way for the um, hardware to provide events to the game anymore, the game would essentially hang. So, but that quickly gave us um, the hints to find out the right places to put the update calls. Um, we ended up with, with four such places where we needed to put them. Um, and that was in the intro, in the main GUI, during the missions, and um, in the GUI code that, that's displayed when you pause the game. getting to the end and uh, one thing I wanted to talk about also is uh, OS X mainly we, when we started the project we only owned uh, Linux and Windows uh, systems so uh, we didn't plan originally implementing or well, porting the game also to OS X but uh, well later uh, as the project went on we, we got our Macs and we wanted to hey let's port it let's port this game also to, to the Mac and well Mac turned out to be um, to cause some problems in some fields. First of all, the alignment uh, of the stack surprised us a little, but well, it was handled in the wrappers, as I said earlier. Uh, well, also, the OS X is an ancient, and I mean ancient version of uh, GNU, and um, mainly we, re we relied on recompilation on the GNU assembler, which turned out to be, well, uh, there was a very old version, but didn't support, for example, global um, the, the directive in the, the, the global 
string dot uh, fill, or C style escapes, etc., etc. There are also instruction differences. For example, uh, you, you know the repeat uh, uh, prefix, the rep. Uh, for example, uh, when, when you operate on the string on, a, on strings on assembler level. Uh, in our code, I think we, we didn't explicitly state the registers used in such operations because they are, well, they are uh, known to the assembler by default. And in these cases, we needed to actually uh, explicitly state these registers. And uh, also, uh, we found uh, a st <laughs> the hard way, once again, a bug in the, in the loop instruction. Uh, basically, uh, it turned out that the old uh, GNU assembler on OS X didn't calculate the rel relative jumps correctly, and we ended up uh, uh, with our uh, with our AIP address in, in the middle of some, in, some instruction, somewhere close to the, to the target location, but not exactly on the target location. So we had to basically re well, ro work around it. And uh, well, instead of loop, use some jumps. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is almost all of the story. There are uh, a little more time consuming than we can really uh, tell you. But finally, we made it. The game runs on OS X, it runs on Windows, and runs on uh, Linux. Mm. So we released it. Uh, basically, we have uh, written some setup tools, like, like uh, a bash script for uh, we were using CD Paranoia for uh, ripping the music on, uh, on uh, Linux, etc. Uh, we wrote, uh, well, actually, you wrote uh, an also installer that had a plugin that ripped also the music from the original CD to the uh, to the to the uh, OGG format. Um, also, we had a script that made uh, the OS X style um, bundles. Uh, and yes, we um, we released the game after five years since we we started the project, so it took us a while. Uh, actually, the, um, we we worked on it a little. Uh, less, I'll, um, well, I'll tell you about it later. Uh, and uh, of course, there are some bugs. Uh, for example, there was a buffer overflow found soon after we released the game. And uh, we, I'm not sure if it was our buffer overflow, but I, I blame it on Bullfrog. It was Bullfrog's buffer overflow. Uh, mainly, uh, the, the, their functions didn't. Um, didn't know about long directories like we, we use today, like some C documents and settings, long username, etc., etc., for storing profiles, and the, the, these functions didn't like it. Um, also, well, there are some things left to do, like uh, network support of a game. Uh, you, you could play in uh, well multiplayer and uh, with with modem, but of course, no one uses modems for that any longer, so it also needs to be ported to, well, UDP, for example. Also, joystick, uh, like Anna said, uh, was skipped. Uh, as for other bug reports, a funny case when ripping the music on Windows, mainly we tested the game with an original game CD, and we found out later that if you actually try to strip the music from, a, from an ISO file, from a CD image, well, I, uh, the, the CD image normally doesn't contain audio tracks, so. Uh, but we didn't detect this condition, and the, um, the, the Ripper went like forever and created music files that had 15 gigabytes of zeros. Uh, okay, so concluding the project, uh, the assembler uh, file that we disassembled was like, like I said, over uh, 30, 100,000 uh, um, lines of code. The code in C that we wrote was, well, it was a little less, it was um, oh, 1.5 thousand. Uh, it was five years, a five year long project, like I said, but actually we worked a few months and then um, we, we um, lost uh, some time for other stuff and we, we got back to the subject about uh, two years ago uh, with, with some minor, uh, minor sub um, comments uh, earlier. And, and and it finally was released, uh, I think, in January this year. Uh, yeah, as for debugging, it was, well, it, I, I said on the, at the beginning that it was a reverse engineering project, and maybe I should correct myself. It also was a debugging project. We spent a c 
countless and countless hours trying to figure out why doesn't something work like it was supposed to be and stumbled upon things like ADX wasn't preserved when it was supposed to. And we also got a cool working game. We could finally play it. And uh, well, an interesting thing is that they actually added support to this game to DOSBox, but, and, and, but well, uh, let's ignore it. So uh, any questions? Um, these are, well, the first page is the, the project page, then it's an about a personal page, my blog, and, and also our team's uh, Vaxillium page.